Hello, welcome to the Enchanted Kingdom of Hermione once again. And uh, I am your host, Zipdung. I'm the Lord Chamberlain of the Enchanted Kingdom, amongst other things. And today, while we watch the Edmund Fitzgerald meet its watery grave, I want to do another installment of my And the Crowd Went Why series. And the crowd went, why? And the crowd, you know, you wonder. A lot of things that have become ingrained in what we might call rock and roll culture, you can, you can take them back to specific points in time, and you can say, that's where that started. And today, I want to discuss a record that's so fucking terrible, I don't even own a copy of it. I can't find mine anyway. The one that I had, and which I wish I could find, because then I could show it to you, this is the first show I've done where I don't have the physical example to wave in front of you. I have to put it on the TV. The Grand Funk Railroad Band, if you will. I don't know what the fuck Grand Funk Railroad means. Probably doesn't mean anything. And they were really typical of the kind of band popped up in the late 60s, kind of a, I don't know how you describe them, sort of a boogie rock trio, I guess. They were one of many of the bands who, you know, they would do extended guitar solos, they would do uh, drum solos, whatever. but they really kind of started this horrible trend. And the place, they did a couple of records, they did an album called On Time, which nobody cared about. And then they did a record simply called, rather cleverly, Grand Funk. And I remember Grand Funk, again, nobody cared, but they put a song from that album called Please Don't Worry, which features the amazing lyric couplet of Please Don't Worry, Bout No Jury, There's Too Many of Us Anyway. What the fuck? I mean, just who? Now, I know the acid was good back then, and it probably seemed profound. But that song got stuck on a sampler record called The New Spirit of Capital. And this was a fairly innovative marketing thing. They simply put this LP out of, I think it was 12 or 14 tracks by 12 or 14 of the artists they were trying to promote. Didn't do much for the Edgar Broughton band, I'll tell you that. It helped Pink Floyd considerably, and I do believe... It helped Grand Funk, who were on it. Mississippi Fred McDowell was on it. It was a pretty, actually, a darn good sampler. And they sold it, I think, for a buck, just about everywhere. Drug stores and... And they made us a, um, a companion one, the new spirit of Angel for their Angel classical label, which is far less interesting. But that was a good sampler. At any rate, Grand Funk, the album got Grand Funk, the band, a little bit more um, uh, spotlight. And then they put out their album, Closer to Home. So Closer to Home came out and kind of not really, didn't really sound much like the rest of uh, their stuff. It was acoustic guitar. There was a string section on it, typical of the kind of stuff that you would use in a 1968 or 69 or whatever pop single. And uh, so, of course, that that was okay. We're doing we're doing good now. Mm. Time for the double live album, and this was like a rite of passage for all of the a lot of bands that were really marginal. You know, did anybody remember Blood Rock Live? You know, and this was a double. This record had this ticks all the boxes for, and the crowd went why. It's a double LP set. Of course it is. It only has, I don't know, 10 songs on it. It's an hour and 16 minutes. Side four is a single song that's 12 minutes long. There is a, there's a really long drum solo on it entitled TNUC, which took me decades to figure out is just a bad word backwards. And it is not a good drum solo. There are endless spaghetti guitar solos. There is endless noodling. Oh, what are the songs? I mean, it, yeah, Mean Mistreater is on it. 
Um, you know, it's, it's uh, closer to home. I think this was actually recorded before closer to home was recorded. I'm not sure. At any rate, it is to me the template for everything that was wrong with the 70s rock excesses when it came to things like, okay, guys, time to put out the double album. Wait, we need an eight-minute drum solo. Why? So the drummer can get some publishing. Good. I have listened to this record more times than I probably should have in the last 20 years. And it's one of those records that after, when I was a little kid, I had a copy of this when I was like maybe 10. And I kind of dug it. It, it. it appealed to me, in, but I couldn't figure out why. And the reason I liked it, I guess, was because there was a lot of Im improvising, if you will. And I'd never heard such a thing. Now, of course, that every subsequent record I heard that featured any amount of extended improvising on it was far better than this one. I didn't know that yet. So I thought, yeah, it's pretty good. And then, and then they started putting out records like Survival and Phoenix and the unlistenable E Pluribus Funk. I should note to people that don't know who Grand Funk is that they are not funky in any way, shape, or form. They are a, well, they're from, I think they're from Detroit area. I guess there's a certain amount of funky in that, but they, these guys, like, like, like they say, the drummer in this band could no more get on the one than he could hold down a gamelan ensemble. And everything about this record, the stage pattern, there's one I can recite brothers and sisters in the front row. When you sit on each other's shoulders like that, people in the back can't see. Unbelievable. It, it's worth hearing once. Don't pay money for it. It's terrible. Not to be completely outdone, they did this record. It sold quite well, if I remember correctly, because in those days, this kind of thing sold really well. And uh, they actually put on another live album, double live album, called Caught in the Act. This was after they'd had some pop hits with things like The Locomotion and uh, We're an American Band and all st stuff like that. There goes the Edmund Fitzgerald. It's done. Goodbye. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, it's, yeah, no, no good. Um, at any rate, Grand Funk, I mean, they maybe did about five songs I would care to hear again. Most of them they didn't write. Um, needless to say, I do believe Mark Farner turned into a Christian right-wing, you know, Nugent-style guy. They continue to fester in some incarnation, but I really can't be bothered to look it up because it's got to be terrible. Frank Zappa, of all people, produced one of their later records, and it it's funny because Zappa thought they were okay. He thought they were just, eh, you know, and his contribution to them is subtle, but it, it was noticeable, but needless to say, the record, they couldn't give it away. And they just kind of faded from view, and they were just another echo from the 60s. I would rate this as probably the worst record of all time that was done with any eye towards being serious. Uh, certainly, I, I'm struggling to think of one I like less. So there you go. And the crowd went, why? Well, they, they went, why? Because, well, you know, I guess if you couldn't be there in Atlanta, I can't imagine how horrible that would have been. There you are. You, that's the next best thing. The double live album on the beautiful green Capitol labels, if you remember those. 12 minute sides, you know, double album price. Every step of the way, a bit of oh, a rip off. Yeah, it's a rip off. I just, the worst. Anyway, that's all I can say. I don't even have it. I'm going to dig out some more of these terrible live albums. There's a lot, there's many to discuss. So. We'll get digging in the crates and see if we can find them. That's it for me. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit the notification button. Give me suggestions in the comments. If you have a great, terrible album you would love to see analyzed by somebody who probably has heard it a few times, I'm all in. Take care and stay safe.